Streaming live via the Internet, welcome to ISP Radio, your weekly source for ISP-related news, events, and interviews with industry experts. If you deliver Internet via fiber optic, wireless, coax, or any other way, you're in the right place. Chat live with us weekly via ISPRadio.com every Wednesday at 11 a.m. Central Time. And now a brief word from our sponsors. Link Technology, providing ISP consulting, support, and hardware for wireless ISPs. TowerCoverage.com, providing online RF coverage maps. Mimosa Networks, providing high-density, high-bandwidth radio products. Advanced LLC, providing retail and wholesale advanced communication services by matching providers with your bandwidth needs. And by Cytel, providing reliability in surge suppression. And now your host for ISP Radio, Steve Grabiel and Dennis Burgett. Welcome back to another edition of ISP Radio. Today, uh, I'm Steve Grabiel, and today I'm broadcasting from my office in Los Angeles, taking a little bit of time off to spend some time in the sun here, but right now it's kind of overcast. And I know I'm making Dennis uh, uh, jealous, but uh, I understand there's snow out there where he's at. But uh, Dennis, are you there? Yes, I am, of course. So tell us a little bit about the weather there. Oh, well, we're just expecting a couple inches tonight. Uh, of course, last weekend they said, oh, you know, the sky is falling. We're going to get a whole bunch of snow. And uh, everybody goes out to the Super Bowl parties. And at 3 p.m., whenever they said we should have tons of snow on the ground, absolutely nothing. <laughs> you know, if Missouri, I think St. Louis is probably the worst place for meteorologists. Because they are wrong 95% of the times, as opposed to the rest of the country, which is at least 80% of the time they're wrong. And they get to keep their job. Yep, they do. <laughs> so anyways, Dennis, is there any uh, news on the front from last week that oh, yeah. uh, we're up against? Oh, yeah, yeah. So let's kind of get into this little news segment we got going. Last week, we had talked about a public notice that the FCC had put out. And this was on January 27th. This is specifically aimed at hotel Wi-Fi blocking. And I'm going to quote from this. Basically, it says that no hotel, convention center, or other commercial establishment or a network operator providing services at such establishments may intentionally block or disrupt personal Wi-Fi hotspots on such premises. Now, a few months ago, Marriott had been found performing de-authentication attacks against unknown access points. In many of these cases, these were things like 4G or LTE hotspots within the hotel. Now, even though they operate their own same network and they pose no security risk to the hotel, the deauthentication attack against them still rendered them useless, thus causing harmful interference. The FCC, in that public notice, ruled that you cannot do a deauthentication attack on these so called rogue access points. But if you have access points that are on your network, there are other ways to detect them, remove them. However, if you are looking at to block personal Wi-Fi hotspots, etc., you cannot do so. Today, we have Animal Farm starting in Salt Lake City. Ubiquity will be announcing their new Air Fiber X platform, which is a connectorized version of the Air Fiber 5 at a cost of, you ready for this one, Three nine nine a unit. Very, very inexpensive. A upgrade to the rocket dishes will allow them to be used with the new Air Fiber X radios. However, there will be some new Air Fiber antennas from 23 to 34 dB. They are promising support for the entire 5 gigahertz band and, of course, GPS sync. A, uh, as I said, a upgrade to the rocket dishes, if you have those, will allow them to use those. You're going to have to find more information on that on their website, as well as at the Animal Farm Show, which goes from today till tomorrow uh, in Salt Lake City. Lastly, we have Link Technologies, which is one of our show sponsors, uh, platinum sponsors, I should add, has announced that we will be stocking the new Telerad LTE 4G product line as Telerad's latest North American distribution partner. Visit their website at www.linktext.net for more information. Now, as far as upcoming events, important things, of course, we have 
Uh, on Monday, February 23rd, we have Wisp America that starts and runs through Thursday the 26th. This show will be hosted in my hometown of St. Louis, Missouri this year and set to be one of the largest Wisp America shows ever. Now, this is right around the corner at the end of this month, so be sure to visit wispa.org for more information on the Wisp America show. With that, back to you, Steve. Well, I kind of find that interesting, Dennis, uh, with Mimosa out there and uh, Ubiquity. I guess they listen to their users saying, give us connectorized gear well, I with mean, the Air Fiber. Oh, yeah. Whenever we first looked at the Air Fiber 5, I mean, it's a great product. I'm not saying it's a bad product. Uh, I, ne- I never say any product's bad. For what it is, it works really good. They really limited themselves without having the connectorized version. And it was only natural progression that we would expect to see a connectorized version eventually. And a matter of fact, uh, Ubiquity actually took that. uh, I'm sorry, not Ubiquity, but uh, Mimosa actually took that feedback before they came out with their product line. And if you notice, whenever Mimosa came out, one of the very first things they did was, hey, we have an integrated unit, but we also have the connectorized version. So yeah. good, in, I, good information. I, I, in there. I praise them for their air fiber. It works like a charm for me, and a lot of the people I associate with uh, praise it too. But uh, yeah, and connectorizing the, it is huge. Oh yeah. Now they changed it a little bit because you know they they call it an air fiber X. And uh, while I don't uh, have the the specs on the old air fiber fives or the the uh, integrated units, the air fiber X is the reason why they probably have the X is that it is dual cross pole. Uh, okay, so it's du- I'm sorry, it's dual slant. So it is 245 antennas versus uh, a zero and a, and a 90. Mm. Uh, and that's what they, they have that upgrade or the, uh, the kit for the rocket dishes that allows them to be modded to where they can run dual, dual slant. Interesting. So, uh, I would suspect that it would run in uh, uh, dual pole mode, not dual slant as well. But I could, I could definitely see that it running better in dual slant, seeing the proliferation of uh, 5 gigahertz vertical and, and horizontal polarity antennas. Mm-hmm. Well, good. That's some good uh, information to know. I know that they just released that. I got an email the other day saying, we're getting ready to release it. And I think it was today they were going to release, uh, yeah, release a- it. And the price point to me sounds pretty fair and reasonable. Oh, yeah. I mean, 400 I mean, 800 bucks for a link plus your antennas. I mean, that's not too terribly bad. Uh, they're they're pretty much announcing everything at the Animal Farm show, and I believe they already have their website live with a lot of the data. I don't think all of it, but I think a lot of the data is out there. So if anybody wants to see more information, they, can, of course, can do so. Mm-hmm. Well, that leads us into our discussion today. We're talking more about Title II and the ramifications that we see coming down the pike. And today on our show, we're fortunate to have Forbes Mercy. He's a uh, owner of Washington Broadband in Yakima, Washington. And he's a board member of WISPA. He's the chairman of the Promotions Committee, the Association Management Committee, and the Disaster Committee. He's busy working for you. He works more than 30-plus hours on WISPA with hardly any time to work on his own network. And according to him, it's all because of the good people he's got in place. And that's a testament to the business acumen he has. Forbes, you there? I am here. Good morning. Hank from Washington, uh, sorry to hear about the... Uh, Seahawks on Sunday, but uh, it is what it is, and I was rooting for them. I root for anything West Coast. I appreciate that, and go Hawks. We'll be back next year, and we'll take the 50th uh, Super Bowl. There you go. That's a positive attitude. So what prompted us to reach out to Forbes to talk on our show today was um, back uh, on January 30th, he sent out an uh, email uh, written by Chuck Hogg as a call to action in dealing with Title II, and that's where we want to discuss this. Dennis and I were talking about this at length uh, in the past, going, it would be interesting to have a point, counterpoint to this issue, um, you know, having someone pro-Title II and someone con-Title II, but in reality, I do not think that you will find a pro-Title II within our industry. Would you agree with that, Forbes? I'd absolutely. I'd absolutely agree with that. The, uh, okay. this, this is an assault on small businesses, and since WIFs are all um, small businesses, I mean, under the Small Business Administration criteria, we are, there's not one member, even our largest WISP is still considered a small business 
and to take on the regulatory requirements of an outdated 1934 Communication Act um, is just uh, it's totally counterintuitive to uh, the way that the Internet industry should be going. Right. So let's talk a, bit, a little bit about the call to action. There was a couple of documents in there. What, what exactly are you trying to get members of WESPA and the Internet providing community to do? Well, the um, oh, by the way, before you go on, I want to comment really quickly on the Marriott thing. And uh, the WISPA regulatory people, our attorney Steve Cran from Lerman Center and Alex Phillips, the FCC chairman, were the ones who uh, were largely responsible for the FCC's final decision to go ahead and stop that interference. We even got to mention a prop out from the Washington Post for WISPA, which is uh, definitely a big time thing for us. And uh, we're really proud of the victory that we had on that. So anyway, that aside, um, call to actions are something that WISPA does uh, very rarely. Uh, there are a lot of work. Um, it sounds simple to just put something out to say call to action, but really it's a, it's a um, tiered process for WISPA. And, and what it does is it entitle, encompasses, I should say, uh, an awful lot of processes. And um, one of those, of course, is we send a uh, request for our membership to you know put down their... Uh, uh, their frequency uh, analyzers for a minute and pick up their computers and send a notice to legislators or to the FCC or both to try and take action for something that will put our industry in peril. And Title II and net neutrality definitely has the potential to put our industry in peril. And so we chose this. And we've done about three call to actions over the course of the time since uh, when I was running legislative and started to do these actions. And they're very good at getting results because they'll go out and we'll send them a template to all the Internet service providers and to say, all you've got to do is fill this template out, sign it, and send it in. If you want to vary it and personalize it, put statistics in from your own WISP as to how this particular call to action will affect you. Uh, it's very heavily encouraged because we, any time that a congressman gets the same letter over and over, uh, it usually files the trash can. So we want to have personalized letters, but we try to make it easy for the members to be able to send these to their representatives and to make filings for the FCC when it's so appropriate. This call to action is based on the fact that the FCC will be making a decision, according to them, it's on their docket, um, in order to decide whether the information technology sector, which is under Title I, and that would be the Internet Service Providers, should be moved into Title II, which is the telecommunication carriers. Now, the growth of the Internet is largely credited to the fact that we were lightly touched on our regulatory um, requirements. That meant that, go ahead, go out there and deploy the Internet as best as you can, do a great job, and it was doing great. We've seen the Internet grow in a more explosive fashion than television or any other media has. And, uh, and because of that... Um, the reward for us is that now the people who have lots and lots and lots and lots of attorneys are saying, how can we control it? And lots of those people are appointed into positions of authority where they can start to say, well, maybe we should put rules. Now, the excuse that they have for moving Title II over is based on net neutrality, which is a legitimate need, because some of the larger carriers are getting a tad greedy now and saying, we want pass-through traffic. We want, if Netflix has to travel across a Verizon fiber to get to uh, somebody else's fiber that essentially delivers it to you, we want to have, um, we want to get some money for that because you're using our fiber. Um, it, it reminds me of the days when they had reciprocal compensation for long distance telephone. That went away as well because it was an unmanageable um, platform to try to compensate someone for use of going over a line when the benefit was also two-way because their traffic also went over the smaller phone lines as well. And this is an awful lot like that. And recognizing that reciprocal compensation is pretty much a failure, net neutrality also has the same type of uh, burden. And that is how do we charge for packets going over somebody when our packets are going back over yours as well and yours are going over ours. So, what we're trying to do is we want to have the FCC go in and say, yeah, um, let's keep the Internet as it is. Nobody charges for the middle mile. The middle mile is a cooperatively built uh, venture anyway, heavily on tax dollars through BTOP programs and other things that have been happening in the past. Um, 
but on the uh, at, under the auspices of trying to fix something that potentially could be broken. On the other hand, um, the far left who loves regulatory suddenly said, well, let's just throw all of the burdens of Title II on top of it as well. Um, I, it, and I, I've, I've always tried to find something that could be a similar scenario where you suddenly say, hey, I'm, I'm you know, running this grocery store and now I'm going to put all the regulations on the grocery store that are required for a hardware store or something. It's just it, it's absolutely burdening our industry with another industry's type of regulatory uh, um, acts that they are under. I have no problem with reducing the responsibility of the telephone companies on regulatory. If they'd like to get out of some of the Title II things, we have no problem with that because how are they going to compete with us since everything is going to IP-based and the POTS type of telephone service is becoming becoming obsolete. So our call to action is trying to get people to send letters to their congressmen, to send letters to the FCC, to alert the local media so that the local WISP becomes a source of expert. Um, so that they're not uh, the local media doesn't run stories from Verizon or something that is counterintuitive to our needs, um, and to uh, have an ex parte filing which was filed yesterday, followed up with a press release that goes on the national scale, um, and as promotions chair, I've gotten three calls this morning for interviews on the press release that we put out this morning already. So uh, it's it's quite a process for us to get it out, but we've shown some. Um, spectacular results in the past, and we're hoping so far on this one as well. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. One of the people on our uh, uh, on our chat has mentioned something about what you mentioned. He says uh, Title II is really a way to get net neutrality. They should be there. Should they should be two different conversations? Net neutrality is important. How it is implemented is also important. Title II should not be a way to solve net neutrality. What do you, what do you say to that? Well, they're absolutely correct. Uh, Title II is a burdensome set of regulatory actions that has nothing to do with net neutrality in its true sense. Um, and, and, and beyond that, we think the FCC really has it, and we respectfully say this because we're great partners with the FCC and they hold WISPA in the highest esteem, But we have to say that uh, we believe that they're violating some of Congress's rules for doing due process and um, uh, putting something like this together. There is already um, the ability under Title I for information services in a section called 706 for light touch regulations to simply enforce the uh, net neutrality standards of making sure that traffic continues to flow freely without having to burden us and pull Title II into our regulatory regime. So it makes absolutely no sense. But the biggest thing that we're really concerned about is the small business factor. Um, There's something called the Rural Flexibility Act, which imposes important obligations on federal agencies and requires significant alternatives when you're about to put rules on small business. Um, These alternatives have not been explored. Uh, The RFA does an initial regulatory flexibility analysis, but largely ignores fixed wireless and small business internet service providers of any type, uh, which is why um, some of the uh, small cable companies like the American Cable Association and even the NCTA, National Cable and Telecommunications, are all on our side on this because uh, they're not giving the proper due diligence of investigating whether small businesses will be adversely impacted by this. So, Forbes, we get a little little question here, uh, a couple questions. So one of the very things, and this kind of goes back to Title II, 4 and, and plus, and I know we need to get this call to action out, and I hope all of our WISPA members get that taken care of and, and do the due diligence. If, if anything, take the letters, send it to the secretary, and let her send it. All you have to do is sign it. That's right. But, we we but, made it very easy for them. Oh, yeah, yeah. But with that said... You know, whenever we look at Title II, there's obviously pluses and minuses. And and one of the things that we see with things like Google is that the Title uh, Title II reclassification will allow Google to get access to poll rights is is one of the reasons why they say it's a good thing. Now, here in Missouri, you you do not have to be a CLEC to have access to poll attachment. You basically send your installer to a a training seminar that's one day, they pass it, and then you just have to request access, and that's it. It's very, very very inexpensive and very easy to do. 
to get started. But I understand it's not that way in other areas. But one of the, the reasons that people come up is, oh, poll rights are, or we need that. Well, that's all great and fine and dandy, but uh, Title II does give CLEX that option. If, if they enforce Title II, I don't think that the poll rights attachment along with the regulatory uh, burden that we will have, justifies getting that done, number one. Another question is, what about USF fees? Um, specifically, do we, most likely, will we have to collect them? And if we do, can we have access to them? The way I understood it, whenever I was uh, reading a lot, right now, a WISP does not meet the definition to access USF funds, even though we could be taxed as a USF if uh, Title II comes in. Okay, I'll take those one at a time. <coughs> Excuse me. The, um, uh, the first one that you asked was about, uh, not USF, but... Uh, full attachment. Full attachment, thank you. WISFA has made um, numerous requests in, in filings to the FCC um, and in other forms as a standalone issue with no relationship to Title II to look for those areas. It's ironic in Washington State where I do business. A private power company, Pacific Power, is the company that uses that is a majority of my area. In fact, all of my area. They have no problem whatsoever allowing us as a wireless internet provider to make pull attachment agreements with them. In the western part of the state, public utility districts, which are government-owned, are the ones who are restricting wireless internet service providers. So in this state, only the government is keeping people from having access to pull attachment rights, and the private companies are allowing it. It's a, a bit of irony I like to see. But WISP on a national scale has constantly been an advocate for pull attachment rights because it's an understandable um, issue when we're simply trying to provide a community with um, Internet service. And as a result, um, we just know that going into somebody's private property is often cost prohibitive. When we want to put a tower up, oftentimes negotiations from private people look at cell phone companies as their template. And cell phone companies have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people on those cell towers while we maybe have 100 to 300 on a cell tower, and they expect us to pay the same rental rate that they would get. And so we lose our prime areas that we could possibly go in when as if we could get in the right-of-way and use pull attachments, uh, we would have the ability then to deploy uh, right next to the property of the person who wouldn't let us rent from them and be able to provide that community with the needed Internet access that they need. So it's an important priority for WISPA to continue to battle for a separate um, issue out of Title II for pull attachments. The Universal Service Fund is a, is a massive issue in itself, um, uh, often now referred to as the Connect America Fund, um, because Chairman Janikowski wrote the uh, uh, adaptation in his rather long um, statement that he made several years ago when he was still the chairman of the FCC, uh, the USF is intended primarily to help now deploy broadband into areas. Now, the FCC has very, been very clunky in how they've deployed the funds. They've done it in several series of, of, um, of issuances um, for people to apply for the money. Uh, more recently than not, they've actually started to favor um, a multi-technology platform approach in that they now are allowing people to apply for the CAF funding uh, based on the fact that if you have a fiber hybrid, wireless hybrid system that serves a community and you can far exceed the amount of uh, uh, bandwidth requirements that currently are in place, which is four down, one up, suggested um, in many areas is 10 down and recently 25 down. But the uh, primary thing is that you're able to draw these funds if you can make a bid to the FCC and, and get some of that funding, and they are extending that now in many ways to uh, Internet providers and not just telecommunication providers, and you can believe that the telecommunication providers are fighting this uh, tooth and nail. So do we want to be under the USF fund? Well, uh, the best way to say it this way is when I had a recent meeting on an advocacy day for WISP on Capitol Hill with my senator, who is Senator Cantwell, her legislative aide asked me this one question as I sat down at her desk. So how are you going to make it harder for the poor to uh, have Internet? That was her first question. I definitely knew I was in a Democratic senator's office. And, um, and I answered, you are. You are because you're going to provide a regulatory environment that causes for me, 
who has a staff of five, has to hire two more people simply to fill out forms, do surveys, monitor network management, and other burdens that come in Title II. So do we want USF? Some WISPs say, hey, I'll take the money, because if they don't hand it to me, they're going to hand it to my telephone company. We've also had the ability under USF to stop CAF funding from going into our respective areas. My company, Washington Broadband, was one of those victors who was able to file and then have the uh, um, exemption so no CAF money can be sent for CenturyLink in my, or Frontier in my particular area. And so WISPs also have the ability to use legal firms that are readily available through WISPA to file those types of um, objections. But to wholeheartedly say no USF for anybody, uh, WISP is pretty split on that one. And so we pretty much let the members do that battle. But do we want to have the responsibility of having that tax put on the Internet? Well, that goes back to answering the senator's legislative aides question. Do we want the Internet costs to start going up, making it less accessible for the poor and less accessible for us to um, be able to get the Internet to the people who really need it to get jobs and stimulate the economy? You hit the nail on the head. I wanted to talk about the nuts and bolts about what this Title II could do for me as an ISP and you as an ISP. You mentioned stuff about, you know, if we go down the Title II route, <clears throat> I'm going to have to hire someone or hire a firm, and maybe this could be a positive effect of the going to Title II, is we're going to have to hire people that full-time fill out all this paperwork and if we're stuck in collecting taxes for this stuff someone to pay that stuff the, those taxes for the USEF and all that stuff it's just additional expense that me as an ISP that is running on extremely tight margins could not afford and then the other thing too is my cost would definitely go up you would start seeing these line item taxes you see on your cellular bill for taxes and Every, t every time you talk to someone, I'm paying all this tax and my actual cell phone bill is not that big, but I'm paying all this tax. And currently, the only tax that uh, they have to pay for me is uh, the gross receipts that uh, we receive to the state. You know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a non-paid-for tax collector for the state, and if I screw up, I'm held uh, accountable for that. But, uh, you know, I'm a tax collector, really. So... You know, above what you mentioned about having to hire and your costs going up, what are some of the other negative effects? And you mentioned, you know, how is that senator telling you, how are you going to make it harder for the end user? And I loved your response. You. Are there Thanks. any other uh, things that I'd mentioned that, you know, the, the burden's going to be upon the end user financially? Are there any other effects that you see that – that I'm not seeing here? Well, the reason that WISPA filed an 18-page ex parte presentation to the FCC yesterday was to detail everything. And, I, and we posted it to the WISPA's member list, and I invite anybody who's a member of WISPA, and if you aren't, you should be. But if you um, um, looked at our members list, you would have seen the filing that we did yesterday. And it goes through detail, point by point, to great detail as to all the things. And it's not just about taxes. It's how you manage your network. Right now, we use reasonable network management practices to monitor our network. But under these new rules, we could use a one technology style of management catered to the telephone rules, not the information services that don't even fit the type of technology we use. So the rules aren't just for taxing, and it's not just for monitoring, but it's for congestion. It's for outages. It's just a tremendous amount of burden that would be put on top of us that is in addition to taxes, in addition to the other things. It's reporting for things we've never had to report before. The public doesn't care about knowing those statistics, but it's an expense that we're going to have to incur for no real um, reasonable um, point. And so it's very, very widespread as to the regulations that are being put on us. There's um, something called um, forbearance that uh, has been talked about, if you've heard of that. And um, forbearance is, is basically a way for the um, abstaining from the enforcement of a right. Um, I always like to think of it, if I could put it in something a little easier to understand. In my state, it's illegal to talk on the cell phone. The police have an exemption. They can talk on their cell phone when they're driving. So they are forbeared from that particular regulation. And so... What they're saying is, okay, we can put all these burdens and regulations of Title II on top of you, but we can forbear you 
from having to enforce those regulations. Now, I have never in my life seen a government agency that sticks to that very long. So even if they use that as the carrot for compromise, it is not a, uh, a uh, positive way to look at um, not having Title II put on top of Internet information service providers. We need to stay under Title I. We need to not be under Title II. We need to not even let forbearance be an issue of what we're talking about. We need to be recognized as small businesses and excluded completely from any of these burdens and regulations unless their uh, effort by the FCC has suddenly switched from encouraging competition to going back to a monopoly style or duopoly style of Internet provision. One of the, one of the things, Steve, that uh, I had looked at in the past is uh, something that Forbes just mentioned, which is the reporting aspect. Um, collecting the, the USF funds isn't a big deal. Uh, you know, you add it to the bill. Does it add extra cost to the end user? Of course it does. But what we will also see is, is uh, USF recovery fees, which you probably see on your cell phone bill anyway. And what that is, is that's the, the thought of it's going to cost me X, Y, Z a year to do the regulatory requirements for this USF, to have to pay someone to ensure that we're doing it correctly, to move the money around. It costs me to collect the money. You know, if I'm collecting 17%, but they're paying by credit cards, that means I'm losing, you know, uh, 2% of that that I have to then give to the government. So they put in a, a fee, two, three, five bucks. We see that. But on top of all that, is the reporting requirements and think of it this way your tower gets struck by lightning it's an act of god or you know you you can't you can't cover that you can't sit there and say uh or prevent that but now you have to have a five page report or uh, some type of report that you submit to them saying here's why the outage occurred here's how long it lasted exactly Here's the total number of subscribers affected, business, residential, all this kind of detail information. Here's how we're going to rectify it. Here's what was done to fix it. And here's what was done or what is going to be done to uh, prevent it in the future. I mean, it's, it's just an amazing, amazing piece of information. And then think of this is that, hey, you have USF funds. So, so you're, you're collecting USF funds, so now you can request USF funds. Well, what if they go back to those types of documents? and say, well, guess what, your uptime was you know, 98%, so you don't qualify all of a sudden. Now, I'm not sitting there saying that these are actual laws and these is, is actual things inside the USF, USF or Title II. I have not read all that. I'm just giving you an example of, holy crap, look at the reporting requirements. As Forbes said, you're going to have to hire a person, at least, just to, one, make sure that your regulatory compliance is complete, Two, to collect the funds and make sure you're basically not losing money on it because it's really easy for you, you know, if you collect $50,000 and you take 3% out of that uh, in, in credit card fees, well, who's paying the rest? Who's paying that 3%? You are. So there's another, another little aspect to it as well. So you have to go and make sure that you're not literally losing money by collecting these fees. Not that's the mid- nuts and bolts I'm talking about. Right, exactly. Right. You know, and and not only on top of all that, now you now you're paying this person to do all this. You know, uh, a lot of people are saying, you know, hey, we think forbearance is going to be a good thing, but in in actuality, and as as uh, Forbes has said, the real big question and the real big thing in this is, Title II should not apply to small business businesses. Now, I understand that once you get to a certain size. You know, you can handle those regulatory issues easier. You can handle the cost of providing and following those regulatory things easier. Uh, but I think things like the poll attachment rights, et cetera, is definitely outside of really what we should be looking at. Title II is not a solution to those types of issues. Right. Title II, and there's a lot of baggage that comes with it. And... Instead of just go, lobbying everybody uh, into that, we should have other information. We, should, we have other ways of going about that and other ways to lobby against these things. And as Forbes pointed out, I find it really highly funny, as he said, about the power company. The, the, the public utility is the one that won't, won't do it. That's just hilarious. No, I think he said the public company would. It's the well, sorry, rural the, electric the, companies that uh, stonewall The government us. one, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Right. 
Yeah, it's well, like, you yeah, know, it, I thank you for the nuts and bolts. And, you know, just back to what you were saying about the example of having to fill out a, a TPS report and triplicate for the federal government on an outage. It's like when people, when I do get struck by lightning, and it happens, would you rather me be sitting there answering your phone call because I'm a small shop and telling you what, what we're doing, or would you rather me up on the tower fixing it? Every dollar that's taken away from a person who has to fill out a regulatory report is one dollar they couldn't use to improve the network to increase the quality of service that's being provided to their rural communities. Go, going, Thank back, you. going back to that, every dollar taken away is a dollar that we can't put towards the low-cost or low-income families that need Internet access to find jobs, to do uh, homework in colleges, online, etc. We yeah. can't do that. That's another dollar that goes away from Americans that are already working uh, that they that they can't get in, in a form of raises, etc. You know, it it's definitely a, a hard thing to do. And like I said, we we have been uh, I have actually tried to hit up a couple of these organizations that are pro Title II, and it's really hard for them to get them on on because anybody, pretty much anybody that's pro Title II is typically company th- these larger companies that can handle the uh, the expense. The burden. And, yeah, they can handle the burden, and they expect to do that as part of doing business. But a- as we say, you know, any type of small business really should be, uh, you know, hopefully will be exempt, and hopefully we won't just get forbearance. Hopefully it'll be just say, you know, it, maybe that's how they determine it. But hopefully we'll uh, get out of there. But we will we will come to see how it all works out. Uh, also, I note that there have been some other articles, news articles, specifically on Title II. I think it was with Verizon, uh, don't quote me on that, that specifically said the FCC has to have a study before they can enact something like Title II on ISPs. And one of the issues is that that hasn't been done. Therefore, even if the FCC votes for it and says, yes, uh, you know, some of these bigger companies like Verizon, etc., may go to the courts and say, you know, you can't do that. You did not do due diligence to make sure that this is a, a proper impact on, on the people. So regardless of what the vote, if the vote does occur this month, I will be very, uh, I would not see actual action. In other words, uh, things that we have to do at least until the end of the year, if not the end of the next year, based on uh, lawsuits and, and courts, etc. Because I guarantee you someone's going to challenge it, someone's going to challenge it in the courts, and, and there will be something that says, hey, we have to put it on hold until the court decides on it, or the court will say that. So I, I don't think of it that like at the end of this month, all, all of a sudden our world's going to come crashing down. I, I don't think that's going to be the case. Not at all. The uh, decision that's made by the FCC... Um, which is being quite rushed and it's being pushed by one of the divisions that wants to see uh, information services have to have the same regulatory as they are under. Um, they happen to be pushing the FCC fairly strongly right now, but I think that the FCC is quite aware that much like when they tried to do Section 705 of Title I and enforce it, um, that Congress struck them down pretty quickly, and I think Congress is quite irritated that the FCC is rushing to put this through before they have the ability to also study and look at this. And with our last advocacy day, we saw a tremendous amount of activity in the committees of them trying to um, make reform to the Telecommunications Act that would more um, that would be more likely acceptable to the entire industry and help the telecom um, agencies become more competitive. Uh, because I have no problem competing with the phone company. Um, I believe they should be under the same type of rules so that they can compete because uh, with everything going to IP networks, we're all going to be pretty much the same in 10 years anyway. So uh, go ahead and strip back those regulations, but don't just throw them on another service that operated well without them before, uh, or we're uh, all going to be having difficulty in making the Internet grow in the the way that it has in the past. Mm -hmm. So I got a good one here for you. Let's use this example. So the local telephone company starts converting everything to IP. Now they're providing IP services. They're providing voice over IP, etc. So based on this, they actually are going to be less regulated. Let's just assume this whole Title II thing goes goes away or, or fails. 
all of a sudden they would be deregulated because they're moving customers to a unregulated service. How does that, or how do you think that would affect, if any, the uh, the operations in the next 10 to 10, 15 years? I, I think the FCC is trying to stay ahead of it um, by um, allowing the Internet to grow in that sense. Telecommunication providers, if they're called an ILEC, um, which is the incumbent local um, exchange carrier, um, is bound to be under Title II. Uh, I think, one of personally, one of the easiest ways to resolve this issue is to eliminate the ILEC and to make everybody Internet service providers and to make all this information services and to light touch, regulate them as we are, and allow the market to go crazy. And That's a true way to level the playing field. You hit the nail on the head again. Well, I'm, I'm going to say this. We say, regulate, uh, we say level the playing field, but I'm going to give you a, a perfect example of this. DSL in St. Louis and the, the AT&T market here have, has been deregulated. And what that means is uh, one company that I know personally had around 4,000 DSL subscribers. Their whole business was based off being able to resell per regulation the DSL sl- the, the ADSL services in market. They had a significant amount of customers. They probably employed 20 people. It was a small company, but it, 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 they moved quite a bit of data. They were very nice people. Come to find out, all of a sudden, AT&T puts an AT&T U-verse, which is non-regulated now. When uh, this is VDSL, uh, it's still data services, okay? But now they offer the triple play. They offer phone, and they offer digital TV services. So what happens when they do that? Well, the very first thing that happens is the customer sitting there, my customer, going, you know, all of a sudden we had 65 customers of theirs, DSL lines just turn off. The lines are no longer available. They cannot connect out. And they call AT&T, hey, what to happen to their DSL lines, all this kind of stuff. We upgraded the, the DSLAM to UVerse, uh, and that's it. Okay, well, when can I resell that? You can't. No notice, no information given to anybody. Those 60 customers just got turned off from the local company. And, uh, from, from ILEC because now they're deregulated. They don't have to resell it. And all of a sudden, ba- within, within two years, that company's out of business because all of that data is, uh, uh, all of that data is now deregulated and they don't have to resell it. Now, I understand it's probably a bad idea to focus all your efforts onto a regulated service, but that's, that's what happened. Do we think, and, and I'm more fearful of this, do we think by moving all this to unregulated, and now we see the ILEX, et cetera, you know, moving towards data services, you know, what, what prevents them from spinning up a company that's not an ILEC and says that's the company that provides you Internet? Well, one of the greatest things that has always been the advantage of Internet service providers is we're scrappy, we're innovative, and we're not afraid to take a risk. Telephone companies are everything I just said but the opposite. They're, uh, they're paranoid, they're overprotective, and they believe that regulations is the way for them to control a market. So for them, they're all in favor of Title II. Just on the floor of the Washington State Senate yesterday was put two more measures concerning the State Universal Communication Service Program, which would require a 10 down, one up, uh, would require that telecommunication providers be um, um, exempted from um, any of the rules that are under the Title II anyway on a Washington state stance, and then Senate Bill 5425, which also provided a sales and use tax exemption for qualified broadband equipment. Basically, what these telephone companies do is they want to rule by rule. They want to make sure they have an advantage of that going on. And if it came to the point where UVerse and all these other services were not providing fair access, then um, I'm sure the FCC would act to make sure that that provision was made. But in the same vein, we have the opportunity under an open and competitive market to put wireless up and go straight head-to-head against those guys and compete on a fair way as well. And that's the way I would much prefer to compete with the phone company. But they've never had vision. They've never been innovative. They've never been the first to market with anything. When I had dial-up in the 90s, I remember when I was up to 750 phone lines and we were at 16,000 customers, one of the seven people in my community were using my dial-up service. The phone company informed me we would no longer get any new phone lines because the doctors couldn't get fax lines anymore for their offices. 
Um, and they said, we think the Internet's just a fad, and we don't want to risk uh, tying up all these lines for you that could be used for people who will be around a long time. It's that short-sighted attitude of the large corporations, especially the phone company, that has kept them back. And after they realized they were so far behind the curve, they're trying to once again use regulatory to try to um, bully their way into a hostile takeover of a successful industry of the information services. Yep, you, and you said this before the uh, show. This is a wholesale attack from the big guys on small business. That's right. If they can eliminate us, they take away that scrappy competitor. They take away the local touch that we can give. So they're not having to call tech support in India. They're calling their local community people and able to stop in when they have problems to get local service and support and uh, and people who care and are quick to respond, who people who will put a tower up for 10 people whereas um, corporations won't put anything on for under 1,000 people per square mile unless they're subsidized by the government. Yep. But we, um, all of those factors um, are why WISPs and small Internet providers are so valuable to the economy and the true providers of rural America, while the big guys go out there and say we don't exist and that they would need to make the regulations harder for us so that they can get money to subsidize them to go out and overbuild in the areas already held by wireless Internet service providers. Well, Forbes, you mentioned something about what's happening in Washington State. I want to tell a, a little thing about what's happening with CenturyLink down here in New Mexico. Uh, there's a Senate Bill 93, which was written back in deregulation times, and it dealt with dial tone. And they want to modify that to... Uh, lessen the burden on CenturyLink because they're losing POTS lines to voice over IP. And I don't really have a problem with that. They want to – there's a three-tier three situation here in New Mexico where you're either a, a big company with 30,000-plus lines and then the next one is like 50,000 lines and then, you know, you're minuscule under that. CenturyLink's petitioning the government here to uh, say, hey, we've got under – 300,000 lines, we want to be the second tier. And I don't really have a problem with that because they've lost uh, a lot of revenue in the POTS lines that they're offering, and I don't have a problem with them being lowered down like that. But the the sales of this is that they're trying to uh, – the, the marketing side of this is they're trying to say that by doing this, we're forcing CenturyLink to install more fiber optics and D-slams everywhere and make everything wonderful. You know, it's just great. But the simple fact is in this bill, because it is regulated dial tone, uh, the language says we're trying to help them, encourage, encourage them by um, l lessening their burden on the regulatory scheme, meaning they'll save money and not having to fill out as much paperwork because of the lost revenue from the POTS lines. But their hope is, is that they will encourage CenturyLink and the other providers to deploy more broadband to areas. And the, the teeth in this is there is no teeth. They're, what they're trying to do is say we're encouraging them to do it. Now, in New Mexico, uh, Quest or CenturyLink, uh, New Mexico has hardly anyone compared to its other markets, so we're a loss leader for them. And the only way they'll improve services is by uh, subsidized federal government monies. And I guess my question to you is what I'm seeing in New Mexico uh, – with the marketing of, of what they want to do with this bill, encouraging is not shall, meaning by lessening your regulatory burden on a dial tone service that is regulated, uh, there's no financial obligations for them to take that money that they've lost and dump it into broadband. Are you seeing the same thing or something similar in Washington? And, and Dennis, do you see something similar uh, there as well? Well, I, I can simply say that the POTS lines are dying. Um, it's Sort of like saying, um, I, when I ran my dial-up company, well, we'd really like to see high speed, so we're going to hand you some money and encourage you to build out your wireless networks. I didn't wait for the government to tell me that. I didn't wait for the government to hand me money to do that. No, I WISP does. Hmm? Yeah, we use private equity to go out and be innovative and grow into rural areas without the help or encouragement of the government. In fact, we were typically begging the government for more spectrum so that we could go out. We've asked for um, spectrum that would help us in the lower ends of the scale, such as the TV white spaces, to allow us to go through trees 
and many of our rural areas are through wooded areas, and therefore we need to have something that could travel through those areas. We're going to them saying, listen, we want to be the innovators that get it out to those people. And meanwhile, the wireline people are simply saying, well, what can we do to help you build out to individual houses? And a fiber line to a house in a one per square mile um, environment is an absolute waste of money, time, and effort of tax dollars. And the idea that the USF is increasing in price um, increasing its fees, increasing, it should be going down. It should be less money being spent by tax dollars, which I consider the USF to be a tax, not a fee. And um, that should be going down. There should be less people trying to push along and save the uh, um, phone companies. And um, if they're going to die, let them die. If they're not going to be innovative, let them go. There are plenty of other companies the cable companies, wireless companies that are easily picking up the slack if they're unwilling to uh, um, perform their duties to continue to be a technology company. I find uh, there was actually a really good post on our uh, uh, live chat, and uh, it basically says that you know many of the the phone companies per se, the the Ilex, et cetera, are losing lots of money because they're losing pots. I mean, I haven't had a, a home phone line for years, and I know many people do not have a, quote, home phone line. Uh, you know, cellular is, is perforated. We are seeing uh, cell companies offering unlimited uh, unlimited minutes, things like that now, and it's just going to be a matter of time uh, for us to get that. And when we look at this, you know, out where I live, I bet you if, if it would cost me, actually, I think I know it's, it's $53 for a standard line they can call in St. Louis, and uh, on top of that, I guarantee you that we're, we're labeled rural, so they probably get some type of subsidy on top of that to maintain that line. And right now, I can go out to cellular companies and for 40 bucks a month or 50 bucks a month, so cheaper than my fee, my fee is, can get a cell line and take it with me. However, on the back side of that is that who is providing the fiber backhaul and fiber backbone to most of these towers that customers are going to. Well, most the of the time, it's the ILEC. So I think what the issue really here is that the ILEX and these phone companies need to start moving away from everybody's our customer to, hey, let's provide the core infrastructure that is needed and let other people handle the individual user, which to me is a much more profitable and much more simpler job. You know, uh, you, it's it's a lot easier. I know one one company that all they do is they build a wireless network and they allow uh, resellers to come in and resell on the dang thing. And for what they do, they actually handle things very easily, very quickly, uh, because all they care about is all of our APs up and is our backbone up and running. Each individual customer is really up to the the end user or the, this reseller to handle. So it's cheaper for them to to handle that. With uh, you know, they, they handle 20 customers that are resellers than it is for them to handle you know 4,000 customers that aren't resellers, and they actually make more money of it because they can be more, uh, as you say, scrappy. Uh, but that's not what these these companies want. And uh, just like the music industry and the television industry and the movie industry, nobody wants to innovate and to change. They want to stay the way they are because that's how they know how to make money. Mm-hmm. Anyway. <laughs> what, one question we've got from the chat is, is <clears throat> this is for both you guys because you're both board members of WISPA. How, how does uh, WISPA feel about the president's desire and the desire to enable municipal-friendly network rules? <laughs> well, let's put it this way. When the president made that speech, uh, the promotions committee went into almost a panic mode of, wow, we have to be ready. We're going to be ready for the State of the Union, which is the next week. We've got to have a press release ready. We're going to have to go hard after the president for suddenly thinking that tax-operated systems are better. And trust me, I I have to uh, testify at Washington State Legislature more than once when the PUDs, the public utility districts, are trying to be able to sell retail because their wholesale uh, middle mile processes aren't working and they're not making any money at it. 
So the idea of municipal getting in the retail business is absolutely ridiculous. We are all ready. We had a press release ready. President gave the State of the Union address. Didn't say a thing. Barely. Simply that we need better internet. Yeah. So we kind of like, ah, oh, darn it, we missed a good opportunity <laughs> to, to go after them. And so is uh, are we very keen as to this kind of a threat? Absolutely. Would we go after anybody who even attempted to do something like that? Absolutely. Um, I'm very aggressive on the promotions committee and going after people. Um, and I believe that it's our obligation to never give an inch of um, free enterprise and uh, market capability to self-sustain. And anybody who threatens the livelihood and the investments that have been made in wireless Internet service providers, WISPA is totally committed to going after anybody with both barrels at any opportunity we can. It's good for the industry, and it's good for WISPA, because any time that we go after somebody aggressively, uh, we get uh, larger media protect coverage, which gives us more credibility in D.C., and that more credibility translates into a greater voice in making change and sticking up for the little guy. And trust us, we are the little guy. Well, Forbes, you mentioned before the show a story about being in D.C. at a conference. Intimate what you just said, because it dovetails perfectly in what you just said one second ago. Well, if you mean the advocacy days, um, that's something that I started uh, when I was legislative chair uh, several years ago, and now WESPA goes back twice a year, and our current uh, legislative chair one, Elizabeth Bowles, does an excellent job of putting those together. And we take a variable number of people back who we split into groups of three, and we go to um, Capitol Hill, and we meet with legislators, uh, primarily on the Commerce Committee commu- um, Communications um, Subcommittee, and uh, uh, we talk to them all about uh, the things, the issues about us and uh, the, th- the needs that we have. And I think one of the most compelling um, issues about us going up there, the stories that we have, is how amazed they are to hear from us. Because, like I said before, the Northeast sector of Verizon, 160 attorneys. Those guys are almost daily going in to see them, telling them that guys like us, like Wisps, don't exist. And when we come in and tell our story, their jaws drop, and they're so amazed to hear that rural service is being done and that all of this hoo-ha they hear from the corporations is essentially a lie. And i got to tell you, you can think what you want about Congress, but if you walk into a congressman's office and lie about there not being service somewhere and there actually is, you lose credibility, which is why when people say, why should I go back to Washington, D.C., I will always reiterate one person can make a huge difference. And the best story I have to tell is back to Senator Catwell again, who is a good friend of ours for WISPA. And I went back there in the first advocacy day and had a meeting with her. And um, we talked about the white spaces. And the Republican, uh, the, the House side of the Congress, was about to introduce legislation that would give all of the white spaces to license only uses and auction it all off with no provision for the future of unlicensed in that lower band. I expressed that concern as one of our talking points to the senator. By the time I got back to Steve Cran's office, he said, what did you do? And I said, what do you mean? Senator Cantwell just went down to the floor of the Senate and said, I will not allow anything to come through this committee if it does not provide for unlicensed in the white spaces area. And that's why at this time, while we're still fighting for it, we at least are part of the argument. One person can make a difference. Each individual that comes with us back to Advocacy Day makes a difference. They're glad we're there. The last thing every legislator ever tells us is, please come back more than twice a year. We need to hear your view. So the impact of small business is very profound on Capitol Hill. We just have to show up. Right. One of the comments on our uh, live chat was uh, here in New Mexico, we had a a distinguished senator for many years, Senator Pete Domenici, once told me, that for every letter he got on a topic, he felt it represented the views of 100-plus voters. So that dovetails into exactly what you're saying. Absolutely. You make a difference. You just They want you to participate in the process. You are not a silent voice, especially when you represent people that are in the ideal market. Because even though the Democrats like to embrace the idea of them being the founders of rural America, the Republicans are primarily the representatives for most of rural America, and their constituents want Internet. And so they're more than happy to help us to acquire the ability to do high speed. They just have to know we exist. 
and it's each of our members' responsibility to pay a visit to their congressmen and let them know they exist and let them know the impact not only economically and through workforce um, that they're able to uh, assist, but also to who they serve and how far out they serve. I serve the largest landowners in, in Yakima County, which is my county, um, by tying all of their warehouses together with uh, gigabit radios and so that they can have a machine at their main office producing a label on their manufacturing line where they are producing, uh, producing but packaging apples um, clear across another part of the rural part of the county. And that's all because of us, not because somebody was subsidized to move a line out to their area. Right. Well, one thing, uh, just to make sure we note before we wrap up, uh, as Forbes uh, has said, the call to action has been sent out. These are template letters. They're very easy to use. Get them to your secretary. Get them to whomever you wish to that can print them and get the names and addresses and get these things mailed off. All you need to do is sign it. That's it. Okay? Send it off on your company letterhead. Everybody will be happy and it will help WISPA tremendously in both the net neutrality, Title II, and... Uh, of course, uh, on the uh, uh, all the other issues, including uh, your FCC, your uh, 5 gigahertz rulings, your 365, and we have tons and tons of things going on this year uh, and last year. So make sure you get that. If you haven't got that, you should. At Forbes, everybody, every WISPA member should have gotten that already, right? Yep, every member that's on the members list would have gotten it. If you're not on the members list, because it can get busy. Uh, please contact uh, me at uh, Forbes at WISPA.org, and I will send it to you. And uh, I'd be happy to make sure to follow up with anybody who needs any concerns. If you contact your media and you're afraid that they're going to want to interview you and you don't know what to say, you can contact me once again, and I'll help you with the talking points for that. And anytime that you can personalize your letter by giving local information as to how you serve your community included in the letter that we sent you as a template, that's a big plus. It makes it look, look a lot less template and a lot more personal. Yeah. And, it and I, I, I know that you dump a ton of time into WESPA and, and s- supporting us in this cause. A couple of questions uh, on the chat was, are, are these um, calls to actions on the website? And I know that that's more added burden to WESPA, but I think if uh, that could be put on there, that would be beneficial. I, I don't know. I don't know if people go there to get those kind of um, – documents but if they could be put up there the template and downloaded i I got the email and i'm going to fill out mine and send it in but uh you know if we can make this easier and i know it's an extra burden on wispa but what are your thoughts well i can the the website's being redesigned right now Uh, we've changed data companies and our website is heavily um back-end data driven but i will talk to the designer since the website is run by the promotions committee which i'm chair of and I'll ask them if maybe we could put something up there. One of the guarding things I say about that kind of thing is we don't always like to tilt our hand to our competitors in every way. And yeah. I can assure you that our competitors, our people who are opponents to us in this, uh, look at our website. And I sometimes, you know, and I'm not being paranoid or tin hatish here. I'm just saying that if we cannot tip our hand as to everything we do, that a call to action that I publicly put out on a website might also inspire them to um, tell all their employees to send a letter in, and that could overwhelm our letters. So not always something I would do. I would prefer that if you needed information, you emailed me at Forbes at WISPA.org, and I will send you that information. Wonderful. Well, um, Dennis, if you've got any other questions, I think it's time to wrap the show up. I think we're good. Uh, Remember, everybody, WISP America coming up here uh, end of February. I hope to see everybody there. Uh, let's see here. What do we have what, next week? We have uh, uh, Bill from Bill Max on the 11th coming in next week, so be sure to be in on that. And we are definitely hoping to get some type of uh, copy or information of what the FCC chairperson proposes. Uh, I'm hoping for the, the following week, which I think is the 17th. I'm hoping that show we can get somebody on that uh, has a little bit more knowledge. I'm sorry, it's the 18th. A uh, little bit more knowledge in exactly what the uh, Chairman Wheeler is proposing uh, so that we have a little bit more information prior to that vote. Mm-hmm. Steve Alex will be a great resource for 
for what exactly what you're looking for. Yep. And, uh, yep. We, my job is to disseminate the information. Those guys are really the in the trenches guy when it comes oh, to yeah. dealing with this. Yeah, and we're, and we're, also, we're in contact with them. It's just going to be, you know, have to have to wait until it all gets out. Right, but I lastly encourage people, like you have been saying all along, the dead, they have a blackout a week before the FCC conference where they don't take any more input, so it's essential that it, it be sent out this week. Get it done, guys. Get it done. Well, I want to thank Forbes Mercy for being on the show to explain the call to action and what it entails. It's not hard to do, guys. If you're listening to this show, take some time and fill it out and send it to your uh, to the people that uh, they recommend. It it's only benefits our industry that much more. It keeps us from the sky's not falling, but it potentially could. And we have the ability to head it off now instead of being letting this be jammed down our throats. Well, again, I want to thank Dennis for producing the show. And, again, thank you, Forbes, for being on the show. And hopefully we'll have you on another show to talk about this if you can spare some time from your busy schedule with WISPA. We appreciate all the hard work you do uh, as a board member, and we also appreciate Dennis for all the hard work he does in producing this show and also being on the board with WISPA. And thank you both for allowing us the opportunity to enhance the uh, um, participation in the call to action. It means a lot to us. Thanks so much for this fine radio show and the work that you're doing to keep our industry informed. You bet. Thank you for listening to ISP Radio. We hope you've gained new insights and additional wisdom in our industry as well as your business. Please remember to visit our show sponsors via the links on ISPRadio.com. If you're interested in becoming a show sponsor, contact us at sales at ISPRadio.com.